Thank you, Randy and Cliff. It's nice to see you again, sir. Um, I was reminded of a story that was common in this most recent Wyoming campaign in which we sought to regain a Republican governor and failed. But uh, my colleague, Alan Simpson, kept telling about this friend of his who was going down the road in his old pickup truck and was stopped by a highway patrolman. And the highway patrolman says, uh, going a little fast there, weren't you? He says, nope, don't think I was. He says, well, you were. He says, what's the matter? Don't you, do you have a governor on that truck? No, sir, that's manure you smell. He says. <laughs> I was also reminded when I was listening to sort of where I had been in the, in the Senate and Randy's introduction of a time just after I had been appointed to the Intelligence Committee and I'd gone back to Wyoming for one of the early uh, constituent trips that I, that I was taking. And I was asked by uh, an elderly Republican lady uh, what committees I was on, and I told her about the, uh, about the Judiciary Committee and about the Environment and Public Works Committee, and, and, uh, and said, I also serve on the Intelligence Committee. Oh, how nice, she said. I always thought they needed one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that when I came uh, to Washington, uh, I was a rancher, and uh, I used to shovel for free when I now get paid to go around the country and shovel. You know, but <laughs> I, knew, I knew very little, frankly, about intelligence when I was appointed to that committee. Uh, I, you know, I was a devotee of spy novels and a variety of such things. But I really didn't know then that it is the first arm of a free nation's defense of its freedom that without an adequate intelligence capability, nothing we do or no way we respond in the world can have any consequential meaning. No amount of arms buildup can confront a threat that we don't or cannot recognize. No amount of defense of the institutions of our freedom can be there without a counterintelligence capability for those who would tear them down. Cliff was just, for example, telling me at the end of the war, World War II, he joined a veterans uh, uh, organization. Uh, what was it called? The American Veterans, the American veterans Committee, who had as its motto, Citizens First, Veterans Second. And he was admiring of the stand and the, and the posture that this took, and the Communist Party penetrated it. And over the course of time, uh, while the American Veterans Committee managed to stand on its own and root them out, uh, the success that they had was that they discredited it as a leftist organization. That kind of thing can take place throughout the institutions of, of a free land. Uh, in this instance, it wouldn't have required an intelligence community to, uh, to, uh, to find that out, but it would require an intelligence community to find out that they had penetrated the higher organizations of the defense uh, industrial establishment, the defense establishment itself, uh, the judiciary, any of a number of other functions that we have just domestically. So I was asked today if I would speak to you about the role of Congress in U.S. intelligence and what it has been and what it should be. And I do that as one who is both an ardent uh, supporter of the concept of intelligence oversight at the congressional level, uh, and an opponent in some instances of the ways in which that has taken place. The most curious thing, and let's just address it in the beginning and then in the questions afterwards we can, is the result which has just taken place, if it is true that uh, the administration has while proclaiming its abhorrence of dealing with terrorists, been dealing covertly with Iran uh, in order to gain the release uh, of certain American hostages. 
The problem there is the suspicions of both sides have been confirmed. The administration bypassed the congressional oversight uh, because it thought that it would not be able to hold a secret, and they have been proven right. But the congressional oversight process has established itself because it thought that administrations, not this one in particular, could not be trusted to make responsible choices. So both sides have proved each other's fear and have solved and resolved virtually nothing. The problem that the administration had is, is an old axiom that uh, I have learned and, and have espoused and think that every incoming government ought to embrace, that if you are going to undertake a covert action, and covert action is necessary from time to time in the defense of freedom, but if you are going to take it, you must be certain that it is an action that you would be proud of and openly embrace once its covertness has been removed. You can suppose in a free society that covert activity is sooner or later going to become overt. It should not be something that you did to hide it from the American people, but it should be something that you did to hide so that you could accomplish what you set out to accomplish. That was the failure of this particular thing. The reason that they did it, and I have no quarrel with the administration stepping outside the oversight process to undertake an activity uh, to release hostages or anything else, if that activity as an element of sense, but the problem with the activity as it has yet has been produced today, and it may change when all the word comes out on it, but as it appears to be today, it is an activity that was only half crafty. It was a good plot, but it wasn't thought through. And so you have a situation in which oversight might have spared them that demonstrated uh, uh, by the reason that uh, that the, you know, the activity itself is not very admirable. And you have on the other side, uh, the reason why they went around the oversight process amply demonstrated by the incredible embrace of political advantage that is seemingly coming out of uh, a number of people in Washington on both sides. The essence of the matter uh, of Congress's role then is that Congress can and Congress has played differing roles. What role it plays depends in large measure on what congressional leaders think at any given time and know about intelligence. Many do not know very much, and many think of it in reactionary terms. That is something somehow or another unbecoming of a free nation. And above all, it is dependent upon how these leaders view the United States in the world. If they do not have a positive concept of what the United States ought to be uh, in its own defense and in the defense of liberty in the world, you will not have a very positive concept of what intelligence oversight ought to be. If those people believe that the trouble with the world is that the United States is too strong and assertive, Congressional leaders then see themselves as uh, watchdogs over a rogue elephant. You may recall that word from the, uh, from the church committee days. If they believe that the U.S. is too weak and U.S. Officials, officials insufficiently competent, congressional leaders actually see themselves as advocates of effective uh, efficiency and competence. Now, congressional oversight in intelligence activities really began in the early 1970s. Now, those pursuing congressional oversight at that time started from the supposition that the United States had an excess of intelligence. They questioned, largely on moral grounds, several of the existing functions of intelligence community. In particular, they questioned covert action. They therefore set about restricting the intelligence budget for those functions, stipulating precisely what in U.S. intelligence should and should not do, and placing people friendly to their point of view in the top ranks of the intelligence community. The most 
talked about, but not the most important of the reforms of the 1970s was the Hughes-Ryan Act. It became law in December of 1974, and it had two immediate effects. First, it made all covert activity the direct responsibility of the president and required him to certify, and I quote, that each such operation is important to the national security of the United States. And now this, to intelligent people, is no restriction at all to a president and an administration worthy of their jobs. But it does intimidate the timid. And the second thing that Hughes Ryan gave Congress is a virtual veto power over covert operations by requiring that so many congressmen be notified prior to those operations uh, taking place. Therefore, a covert operation could always be preempted through a timely leak to the press, and they have been, and you saw a wonderful example of that this year when, uh, when I believe the Senate Intelligence Committee leaked to the press the fact that we had a covert uh, program going in Libya that was set about trying to discredit Muammar Gaddafi in the eyes of his own people. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to do to a wartime circumstance that threatens, threatens this country and threatens the whole uh, stability of the Middle East. But leaks to the press uh, destroyed that operation before it even started. But the consummation of the revolution in the United States intelligence came not from Congress, but from within CIA itself. In 1976, President Carter assumed office. He and his director of central intelligence, Stansfield Turner, and a man named David Aaron, who once made interesting charges uh, and broadcasts uh, from Radio Hanoi back to American troops. He was the man in charge of intelligence at NSC. They appointed to positions of responsibility at the CIA people like John McMahon and Bobby Ray Inman, who are precisely the people who had worked with the Congress in the early 1970s to start this revolution. American intelligence capabilities, and from that moment on until a later time, in which I'll get to, were scaled back and transformed. American intelligence capabilities between 1979 and 1970, 1977 and 1979 saw the number of people in the CIA drop by no fewer than 930. It's a substantial number of people under any set of circumstances uh, in a bureaucracy of that nature. Most important, between 1976 and 1980, three-fourths of the agencies Supergrade positions changed hands. Three fourths changed hands. Now, I do not know in the history of this country of a more thorough purge in any government agency in so short a time. It was absolutely astonishing how that took place. The CIA's funds decreased significantly in real terms every year of the Carter administration until fiscal year 1980 when it almost kept up with inflation, slight increase over, over the year before. But these gross statistics do not adequately reflect the revolution that was taking place through the cooperation of congressional oversight and the Carter administration. The CIA underwent a reduction in force in some areas, but an increase in others, all of which reflected a jaded but very coherent view of the legitimate intelligence operations put forth by the Church Committee and by CIA Director Stansfield Turner. Now, I want to underline that the relationship between congressional overseers in the late 1970s and the high command of the intelligence community was totally cooperative. Indeed, when the election of 1980 ousted what was the heart and soul of the church community, uh, committee, William Miller, he was the man who made the church committee go from the post of staff director 
of the Senate Intelligence Committee, John McMahon and Bobby Ray Inman and Stansfield Turner gave him the Intelligence Medal in a warm and moving ceremony at CIA headquarters. This was the man who simply destroyed any cover that the uh, intelligence community had had when they started the Church Committee hearings in the 1970s. Now, what changes did this executive legislative alliance make? Well, first was the reduction in the number of clandestine intelligence collectors, humans. This heretofore legitimate intelligence function was totally de-emphasized, and a huge percentage of the senior operations officers, 820 in all, were dismissed. You may recall it was called the Halloween Massacre. Those forced out at headquarters were high-ranking officers who had run the biggest and most successful operations at CIA. They also happened to be what was viewed as hardliners. I had the privilege of finding out for myself that Stansfield Turner and John McMahon were substituting justification for the truth when they said that those fired were low performers. One of those fires happened to be universally acknowledged as the star of the European division, a man who knew more about what went on in the governments of Europe, both East and West, than any other human we have ever had, a man whose career had been spent in that and who had been totally successful was gone, fired in that area. Second, there was a shift away from collectors able to pass themselves off as foreigners or private American citizens, and a shift toward an almost exclusive reliance upon people under so-called official cover. They sit in embassies as uh, assistant directors of agricultural functions and, and what have you. So there were no more clandestine collectors operating as clerics, academics, journalists, or businessmen. And this had the immediate, and I submit intended, effect of reducing the spectrum of people such collectors would be able to infiltrate. I mean, after all, it is very hard to penetrate a drug ring if you look like you stepped out of Madison Avenue. You have to look like somebody in the business, eh? So you have an American civil servant clothed in a three-piece suit he tends to stick out at the labor union rally, you know. And he tends to be totally obvious, trying to penetrate a terrorist cell. So congressional overseers thought that this was fine because they believed that we had enough intelligence. And besides, we were not very, facing very serious threats anyhow. Third, counterintelligence also saw a decline beginning in 1974. And during those years, the counterintelligence budget dropped to an insignificant fraction of the total. And I can remember asking Stansfield Turner if it was not possible that there was a mole in the CIA. And he said, no, it was not possible. And I said, well, I cannot imagine a more benign environment for moles to exist in and that which they cannot be believed to exist. What do we do to look for them? Well, since they can't exist, we don't do anything to look for them. And that's, that's, was, that was policy. Now, more importantly, the responsibility for figuring out the bona fides of agents who shifted uh, to those who recruit and ran them. Eliminating the counterintelligence services is the intelligence community's equivalent of sacking a corporation's department of quality control. It simply says, we're not interested in our product any longer. Congress, congressional overseers, however, thought that this was grand because they could not believe that hostile intelligence services could or would be so bold as to try to deceive their friends at CIA, nor so competent as to succeed. On the other hand, increasing funding went into the technical means of collection, which became enshrined in the arms control jargon as national technical means, that's what they became called. And because of the emphasis on arms control, these devices, uh, these systems, were largely designed to monitor the details of the SALT and other agreements, uh, threshold test bans, et, et cetera. In some senses, these devices were over-designed in order to measure features of arms control agreements 
that either never materialized, uh, such as limits on throw rate, or were important only in the context of the agreement itself and not in terms of the U.S. national security. I've mentioned such things as the volume of a missile silo. It makes little difference to us what the volume of a missile silo is. If the missile can shoot, then hit us. Uh, or the placement and orientation of large phased array radars. You now know that we have one that is in violation, the one at Krasnyarsk. I tell you that that is only important to us because it is located on a piece of the Earth in which it's not supposed to be by the ABM treaty. But I also tell you that it is the last of a ring of six, the other five of which are totally legal, but which provide the capability of the Soviet Union for command and control of a total nationwide ABM system. So we got focused on where things were on the Earth and not what the threat to the United States was. But what more important to this was the sheer expense of this path, and it led us away from others that would in a few years seem much more useful or of greater strategic importance, such as the ability of intercepting communications connected with terrorist activity or being able to find strategic relocatable targets like Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles that are mobile and anti-missile systems. So we spend a lot of money getting more and more sophisticated systems whose view of the world was necessarily narrower and narrower, and, and it was designed to look at places which treaty told us things would take place. The reason it took us so long to find Krasnoyarsk is because it wasn't supposed to be there, so we never looked. There was a violation of the treaty, and they wouldn't do that, so don't look over there. We suddenly found it by, by different means. Again, this whole process was in perfect sync with congressional overseers who believed in arms control the way some children believe in the tooth fairy. Now, the Church Committee and the Carter administration's approach to intelligence were consonant one with the other. They viewed hostile revolutions in Iran and Nicaragua as benign. The PLO not as a servant of the Soviet Union's revolutionary foreign policy, but as a moderate organization with a legitimate right to a place in the sun in the Middle East and arms control negotiations and agreements as the end of the need for serious assessment of Soviet strategic capabilities and Soviet strategic intentions. We didn't bother to assess them anymore because we had a treaty telling us what their intentions were. Now, by 1976, however, and increasingly through the early 1980s, a new group in Congress emerged that changed the role of the legislative branch in intelligence. I think that I, it's safe to say that I initiated this change, of course, along with uh, this change of course, along with other senators, uh, including Senator Moynihan from New York. This group carried on the process that began in the Ford administration called the B-Team, an exercise that, that took the intelligence assessment of CIA's an 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 analysts and gave the same information to a group of independents led by a Democrat, a uh, liberal Democrat from Harvard named Dr. Richard Pipes and some others. It was not a partisan group. It was just a group of scholars. And they said, look, here is the information upon which the CIA based its, its conclusions. You look at this information and tell us your conclusions. Well, they did. And they came to a drastically different conclusion than the CIA had come. And in my first four years on the Intelligence Committee, the CIA spent more of its time trying to discredit the B-team than it did to find out anything about the Soviet Union. Well, ultimately, the B-team's analysis became what was and remains the conventional wisdom of what the Soviet Union had been doing from the 60s on through the middle 70s. Its assumptions were not that an intelligence excess existed, but that U.S. intelligence had never been adequate to the Soviet threat in the first place, and that recently it had declined while that threat had grown. Now, specifically, this group, of which uh, I was a part, called for increases in intelligence budgets, fewer and more workable oversight requirements for covert operations, a reinvigoration of the clandestine and human intelligence branches at CIA, and the reorientation of the kind of analysis done on strate Soviet strategic capabilities that would be more useful in developing a coherent picture of the threat that faced us. 
not simply in verifying unequal and increasingly meaningless arms control agreements. This group succeeded in shifting the focus of Congress's attention to its own agenda, this little group of people in the Senate Intelligence Committee. It won that crucial battle for the agenda, and by 1978, it forced the Church Committee forces to feel obliged to cast their continued efforts to denude U.S. intelligence in the language, at least, of trying to improve it. And it was a major accomplishment. At last, it was, I think, our only accomplishment. With the election of President Reagan in 1980, it gave the uh, uh, executive branch an opportunity to work with this new thrust of congressional oversight. Indeed, in those days, the Congress gladly uh, agreed to an unprecedented rate of increase in both personnel and funding for the CIA. The Reagan administration declared that as a result of this funding, everything has been fixed. More importantly, the Reagan administration made virtually no change in the higher ranks of U.S. intelligence. Now, keep in mind what I told you happened and three-fourths of the senior grades in a matter of two years were replaced. No change in those three-fourths of any consequence. It was something of a heartbreak for me to have to confront my old enemies, Bobby Ray Inman and John McMahon, pushing their old agenda, but now doing it under the cover of the Reagan administration. And at any rate, debate in Congress began shifting the other way, against the president much in the same way it shifted against increased defense expenditures after the White House proclaimed prior to the 1984 election that America had revitalized its uh, defense strength. So while this funding was essential to reinvigorate U.S. intelligence services, it was not by itself sufficient to reform the CIA bureaucracy and to bring about real changes in CIA operations. And since 1981, the Office of Management and Budget and the PIFIAB, which is the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, civilians that come in to, uh, to advise on intelligence matters, they have consistently urged the CIA to increase the number of human collectors, to shift the balance of such collectors to non-official cover from official ones, to restore a career counterintelligence service, and to station CIA experts abroad. The CIA, however, has made only token changes in some of these areas, and the reason for this is simple. Those who affected the revolution in intelligence during the Church Committee and Carter administration years are still in place at the CIA's bureaucracy. The election of Ronald Reagan by itself was not enough to re reverse this. So while Director Casey has unquestionably improved some of the analysis performance, and certainly the community's morale, until the positions of influence in the intelligence community are wrested from those of the church committee's views of what intelligence should be, there is little prospect for greater success in overall intelligence programs and, and needed intelligence reform. There are still many of us in Congress who acknowledge these deficiencies in our intelligence capabilities and will continue to work hard to correct them. The need for constructive congressional oversight has never been greater than today. The chances of getting it uh, have never been more moderate. And I, you know, I mean, and that's not a criticism of the administration, that's a criticism of the interest that people in the Senate and the House take in the intelligence community. You may have seen Senator Durenberger, Senator Leahy over the past two years using it and primarily as a platform for re-election as a platform for visibility. And what we need is people who understand so much in their heart that this country, second to no other country in the world, has bad need of a real capability to identify its threats, to influence policies and positions around the world, and to be able to carry on the business of freedom from a standpoint of consistent knowledge. The role that Congress plays in the future Will be, will be determined by the predominance and effectiveness of the two schools of thought of what U.S. intelligence ought to be. That debate in Congress will continue. 
That debate in Congress has already been engaged. You have seen in the last two days people saying, we're going to have an investigation, not of intelligence capabilities, but of what happened in Iran and for hostages. What we need is an investigation of what we need and a desire to see to it that we're second to none in the ability to know how to act in a world full of threats around us. Thank you very much.